My name is Caroline Staten with Transition US, and thank you so much for joining our online event today. Our principal aim is to provide practical support to leaders of transition initiatives, to those who are mulling over starting an initiative in their community, and to community leaders everywhere that are working on resilience building efforts within their locales. We would like to continue to offer the webinars at no cost, but do ask that you consider making a donation. Uh, we have a donation button on our website at transitionus.org. And thank you so much uh, to those of you who are able to do that. Without further ado, I'm wanting to give you just a brief synopsis of uh, the teleseminar that you're you're joining today. It's uh, financial system and local investing. And how can, how can the stock market reach new record highs when the economy is still sputtering and the middle class is fading away? And what role do our investments play in shaping our world? We will look at the financial capital that has been transformed from a tool fostering economic growth to a self-perpetuating tool growing through trading activities progressively divorced from productive economic activities. We'll talk about the importance of divesting from the old economy and the emergence of four powerful trends that will transform the world of investing. And we'll look at ways communities at the forefront of this transformation are democratizing and relocalizing investments and building a world that is more equitable and sustainable. And our guest today presenting this information to us is Marco Vangelisti. And Marco came to the U.S. from Italy as a Fulbright Scholar in Mathematics and Economics at the University of California, Berkeley. And after a stint in the financial industry, Marco worked as a visual artist on a full-time basis for five years and obtained an MFA focusing on the intersection between public art and ecology. He later worked for six years at Grantham, Mayo, Van Otterloo and Company, managing investment equity portfolios primarily on behalf of large foundations and endowments. And then in April 2009, Marco left the finance industry and has since been instrumental in the formation and development of Slow Money Northern California Chapter, where he currently leads the investor working group. And Marco is currently developing uh, Essential Knowledge for Transition. It's a whole curriculum for engaged citizens to understand the money and banking system, the economic system, and the financial system and how we need to transform them. So Marco is also helping communities increase their capacity for local investing. So that's who we've got today with us. Uh, Marco Vangelisti, he'll tell us more about his website, ways to reach him on Facebook, his upcoming courses, and all that good stuff. So we're thrilled and delighted to have you with us today, Marco. Thank you for joining us, and over to you. No, oh, thank you, Caroline, for the uh, great introduction. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, loud and clear. Great, excellent. Well, I'm particularly thrilled to uh, present this material for you because I spent the last two years really developing it for the movement. I attended uh, a training, uh, in fact, with Caroline uh, two years ago, almost to the day, in Santa Rosa, and I realized that uh, the movement could uh, benefit from a, um, a deeper understanding of how the economic system worked, because obviously transition time responds to the challenges of global warming, peak oil, and economic instability. And there's a very good understanding within the movement of the science behind the first two of those problems. And I felt that I could contribute something in terms of the understanding of the economic system. As I was developing that content, I realized that we also need to understand how the money and banking system works, because that's what, at the end of the day, caused the economic slump we are still dealing with, and uh, how capital and investments in the financial systems work. So we are going to tackle the financial system first. Uh, the next talk will be on money and banking, although I'll give you just a, a teaser uh, during this presentation. And finally, in uh, April, we are going to talk about the economic system. So I have a lot of material. I hope all of you have uh, the presentation. 
And the content is basically, I will give you a very big picture view. I mean, probably the biggest you can think of. Uh, and then I will tell you my personal story in terms of my transition from uh, conventional finance to what I call regenerative finance, most specifically um, slow money. And then I will hopefully get across the concept that business as usual investing is no longer an option. We really need to wake up to the fact that our investments have impact, whether they're called impact investing or not. And sometimes the impact is not what we are uh, working towards. Um, I will also mention four new trends, reshaping invest, uh, investing. There's actually um, Amy Pearl with Springboard Innovation has come up with this way of looking at the four trends that will be transforming the future of investing. And then finally, what you can do about it, because uh, we want to take actions. So uh, I'll start on slide number three. Obviously, this, which is planet Earth, is the biggest system uh, we are dealing with, and actually that we can modify and change, which we have, unfortunately, in the very redactive way in which uh, PowerPoint works, that's transformed into this big green blob that I would call the biosphere or the ecosystem, if you want. And Homo sapiens, right, there's a species operating there. Sapiens is interesting because it means the one who knows. So we're calling ourselves, you know, the wise ones. And uh, we've created a number of systems ourselves. And I mm, want to indicate maybe the largest one and most uh, uh, comprehensive and inclusive as the social system. What do I mean by that? You know, it basically on slide seven, you know, it's made up of the rules and, and things that we, um, and practices and activities that we deal with, science, politics, religion, culture, economy, law, education, and so on. Um, and to a certain extent, we want these subsystems to be in a kind of dialectic relationship with each other, not hierarchical, right? So we don't want religion to run politics, or we don't want economy to become a religion, uh, or politics driving science. Um, but at the end of the day, if you look on slide eight, what I'm suggesting here is that we are looking at a set of nested systems where there is a hierarchy. The biosphere and the ecosystem at the end of the day provides the boundaries and the limits within which our society must operate. Uh, and the social system that we built has part of it, a subsystem, which is the economic system. And again, I would argue that the operations and functioning of the economic system should really be dictated by society as a whole. And the society as a whole should really set the boundaries for whatever economic activity um, uh, we engage in. Now, the economic system on page nine, and again, I realize this is very um, abstract, but I want just to give you a sense for what may be actually obvious, but we are not quite doing it yet. So the economic system has other subcomponents, manufacturing, labor, means of production, distribution, food production, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm thinking finan the financial system is actually what uh, helps the economic system uh, operate. So the financial system includes both investments. They're usually uh, in intended to expand productive capacity of the economy and the money and banking system, which allows for the uh, mediation of economic transactions and uh, the selling and buying of goods and services. So here we are. I think we have on page uh, 10, this idea that there is a system hierarchy between these um, nested systems like Russian dolls. And if we think about the financial system, really the reason to exist is to facilitate economic transactions and to help the economy grow, potentially. It turns out that if you look at page 11, we have violated the um, hierarchy of those systems. For example, and here the color coding is the green is the ecosystem and the yellow is the economy, sorry, the, the society and the orange is uh, the economy. The industrial growth model that assumes that we can grow the economy forever is obviously in violation of the limits imposed by the biosphere. Uh, the fact that uh, corporations now have personal rights is a violation of the fact that, um, you know, the economy should really be at the service of society, not the other way around. Uh, and, you know, I don't want to go through all of them because we have very little time, but I also want to point out on page 12 
that we have some attempt at recognizing the importance of that hierarchical structure. So the triple bottom line idea is that, yes, you pursue profit, but you also take care of the people and the planet, right? So it's a recognition that the economic activity has to operate in a way that does not damage society or the environment as a whole. And uh, let's say slow money at the bottom is the idea that uh, capital, financial capital, should be deployed with the ultimate goal of restoring the fertility of the soil. That is recognizing, you know, the, the hierarchical nature of the systems. And finally, I want to uh, show you on page 13 a, um, a quote from uh, Pope Francis. He sent a letter to the World Economic Forum this last year in Davos, Switzerland, and he said, I ask you to ensure that humanity is served by wealth and not ruled by it. So this, again, is a recognition that the money, the financing, the investment capital should really be there to serve society as a whole and not be ruled by it. So uh, with that, I know this was really fast, uh, but I want to tell you my personal journey from conventional finance to regenerative investing. And it all started here. Uh, page 15 is the only chart uh, that I will show uh, that has um, a lot of stuff in it. But basically, it's, this is an efficient frontier, is an iconic concept in conventional finance. And the bottom line is what, what it uh, rests upon is the assumption that to make investment decisions, all you need to know is what is the return of each investment, what is the risk of each investment, and what is the liquidity. And once you know those three things, you can make an investment decision based on the idea that the higher the return, the better, the lower the risk, the better, and the greater the liquidity, which means your ability to convert that asset into cash, the better. And, you know, after six years of theoretical math, when I saw this, I, I thought, wow, this is the real world. We're getting closer to reality. And it turns out, by the way, this is what I call the narrow lens of finance because conventional finance looks at everything through that very narrow lens. It turns out, page 16, that the real world looks more like this beautiful tree. And to understand really the tree, you need to understand it as embedded in a very dense network of relationships. It is in relationships with our breathing, right? We breathe oxygen, which is produced by the tree, and the tree breathes CO2, which is what we exhale. And the tree is in relationships with uh, fungi in the ground. It's called the, the uh, mycorrhizal relationship. It provides habitat for plants and organisms, builds soil by shedding the filaments of, of its um, uh, roots, and so on and so forth. And yet, page 17, when finance looks at the tree, it sees only lumber, right? In other words, lumber or the commodity value of that tree is the only thing that you can see when you look at it through the narrow lens of conventional finance. Another way of saying this is that the tree, uh, according to conventional finance, is worth more dead than alive. You cannot see all the other relationships and benefits that the tree provides. And this is basically what allows us, at the end of the day, to transform something that looks like uh, the forest on page 18 in the next slide, right? And when we look at this just exposition, we feel um, pain. Uh, we can say, well, what a waste, right? Whatever economic benefit was derived from this operation clearly could not represent the value of this beautiful forest in, on slide 18. Or you can say, uh, you know, how unjust. Uh, to a certain extent, the forest could have been enjoyed by future generations, uh, is necessary for millions of organisms, and yet, you know, the destruction of the forest only accrued some benefits to very few people in this generation, right? Uh, and yet, if you think about that, if investors had bought the forest for $10 million and sold the wood, the lumber, for $12 million, that would have gotten a 20% return. If, a, if they completed the operation in a year, but here's the catch, if they did that in six months, they would have gotten a 40% annualized from that investment. And if they did that in three months, they would have gotten an 80% return annualized. 
In other words, remember what I said, the higher the return, the better. And you can see that there is some haste involved in this operation that led to the picture on page 19. So uh, the next slide, basically this very transformation is what led me to leave the financial industry. As I said, I was, uh, as Caroline mentioned, we were managing a portfolio of investments in um, emerging markets. The firm I actually work for is ethically run, professionally run. They're really a great company um, and serving mostly foundations and endowments. And I remember uh, one year we had a spectacular uh, performance for the portfolio and we were kind of quant, so we used uh, uh, a computer system to select which stocks to buy and you know, layered that with a little bit of uh, fundamental analysis. But I basically looked at what is the best uh, um, stocks that we were holding that generated such a great return for the investors. And I realized the best stock, one of the best stocks, was a palm oil company in Indonesia that had basically taken down tens of thousands of uh, um, acres of rainforest and replace that with a monoculture of palm oil. And part of the reason why they did so well financially was because they were compensated with carbon credits because they were planting trees. So once I realized that, I was talking to the chief investment officer of an environmental foundation that had money with us. We were managing their money and I said, are you not concerned? that the money of your foundation is invested in a company that is just taking down exactly the type of habitat of the orangutan on page 21, uh, which is the goal of your foundation. The foundation was, was you know, founded to protect this environment and this habitat. And, you know, there was a little bit of an awkward moment, as you might imagine, and he said, well, you know, my task, really, my job is to preserve the assets of the foundation in perpetuity. And I thought, interesting, slide 22, that's a luxury that was not afforded to the rainforest that has been there for like a thousand years. And he said, I need to generate a return to support the operations of the foundation and its programs, which is try to save the forest. And so at that point, I realized, okay, I can't, this is a systemic issue. You know, the people involved are uh, well-meaning individuals, you know, with integrity, and, and yet the system sets up incentive to do something that is crazy. So... I left uh, the industry at that point because I uh, couldn't really be part of it. And it is hard to leave a very well compensated job in the middle of an economic recession, I must admit. And then I started looking at this large systems and quickly I arrived at, at the money and banking system. And I want to say something now, which is I'm going to present some material in the next 10 minutes that is a little bit hard to take. And so I want to recognize that. I would like you guys to take a deep breath if that happens and know that I'm going to take you out of it. But I feel that you actually need to know how things work. So I'm going to give you just a teaser for the money and banking because it has an implication on uh, society, the um, ecosystem, and also investing. So, uh, but I will expand on this next month at the um, webinar money and banking. So here is a really condensed version of what I'm going to tell you uh, next month, page 23. Uh, a lot of people don't understand that all money is created as debt. The exception are the coins in your pocket, but both the paper money we use is issued by the Federal Reserve and backed by U.S. Treasuries, which is national debt. And more than 95% of our money supply is actually electronic money that exists on the books of the banks. And those are created uh, through accounting entries when loans are made. In other words, electron new electronic money enters the money and banking system when banks, private banks, make loans. It is not money taken from somebody else. It's created ex novo when loans are made. This has a couple of implications. One is that we don't have a stable money supply or permanent money supply because when loans are repaid, the money supply shrinks. The liability of the banks, the electronic money that they created, shrinks when loans are repaid. And uh, the other problem is that the banks decide basically uh, the first use of that money by lending it into specific sectors. So they've lent a lot in the last 10 years into the real estate sector, um, you know, the mortgages that they issued, therefore inflating and later on deflating a real estate market, which is now being reflated again. And also they, they lent a lot uh, to financial in intermediaries and investors. 
uh, and that created a bubble in the stock market. And that's part of the reason why the stock market is doing so well right now, while the economy is still spattering. The second point that you need to know is that the biggest flaw with the system is that no one within the system ever creates the money to repay the interest on the debt. In other words, uh, the m money that is created is corresponds to the principle of the loan that the banks make. But no one ever creates the money to repay the interest. So in other words, that's how the money is kept scarce and why eventually people will have to default. Um, and this is also the reason why governments have uh, increased their borrowing the last five years, in part to compensate for the shrinking of the debt of the private sector. Um, so these two ideas combined would also explain why uh, austerity does not work. Because when you're saying, okay, government, you need to cut your expenses and your debt, what you're doing is you're reducing the money supply and shrinking the economy. And we've seen that in uh, Ireland, in Spain, in Greece, and so on. Uh, and the other thing that is important to remember is that one of the ways to deal with this need to uh, repay more than the money in circulation is to um, pretend that the economy can grow forever. Because if, if the economy is bigger next year, we can borrow more and uh, enough to repay the principal and the interest for which no money was ever created. So the growth imperative is in part the result of this flawed uh, design system in our current money banking system. And finally, the private banking sector has now the monopoly of money creation. If you ask regular folks who creates money, they might say, well, the Federal Reserve or the, the government creates money, but actually it's not, because if the government could create the money, it wouldn't have no need to borrow it. So it's borrow the government borrows the money from those to whom it ceded the power to create it, and that's the private banking sector. So, um, and this, at the end of the day, money is an agreed upon fiction. The numbers that you see at the end of the day, we agree to use them as means of exchange, but they're nothing more than computer numbers that are backed by the assets of the banks, but it's not clear what the value of those assets are. And so I just want to get across the, con the, uh, the idea that even your uh, financial statements or your, you know, if you have a, an investment account or a brokerage account and you have some investment with Fidelity or some mutual funds, those numbers are not quite real either. Uh, and so if you look at page 24, just to give you a little sense for it, I mean, the GDP last year I think was about uh, 70 trillion worldwide. Trillions are big numbers. But the global financial stocks around the world, so the stock markets and bond markets alone, are $212 trillion, right? So three times as much as the global GDP. And the, this does not include venture capital, private equity, uh, you know, real estate, and so on. Uh, and then if you talk about derivatives instruments, there are also financial instruments held mostly by the banks and uh, investment managers. Uh, they are in, in the U.S. and the U.S. banks are $212 trillion dollars of notional value of derivatives, and worldwide has been estimated to be 1,200 trillion. Those numbers are not real. And uh, again, take a deep breath now, <laughs> because I need to uh, make my point by repeating a little bit what uh, Bill McKibben has shared with us, which is a terrifying carbon math, and link it to the fact that a lot of our investments are not valued uh, properly. So you know the numbers, two degrees Celsius, we can uh, raise the temperature globally more than two degrees, otherwise uh, higher forms of life are not possible on the planet, and we happen to be quite complex as a form of life. So everybody agreed to this in Copenhagen. Uh, I think the 196 countries uh, represented there agreed no more than two degrees. Great. Then the next question was, um, this was asked of the Carbon Tracker, which is a, um, a research company, energy research company in uh, uh, London, I believe. And the question was, how many gigatons of carbon can we still put in the atmosphere without breaching that limit? And the answer was 500 gigatons. And then the next question was, okay, how many gigatons of carbon do we have in the known reserves of the, fo of the fossil fuel companies right now that we know of? And that is 2,800 gigatons. In other words, if we really grasp this concept, we would stop doing 
heavy drill, you know, deep ocean drilling uh, for oil. We would stop the extraction of tar sands because guess what? We cannot burn more than a fifth of what we already have. But here's where I connect that to the um, the virtual quality of va of values in investing. Page 26 shows you the market capitalization of the largest oil companies in the world as of May of last year. They probably went up because the, the stock market had a rally last year. But you know, Exxon is worth 400 was worth 409 billion dollars. Chevron, Dutch, PetroChina, more than 200 billion. Let me ask you, if we really get to the point where we need to leave in the ground about 80% of their reserves and they couldn't you know, sell that, uh, could, is it possible that they're still worth the same amount? And I would argue they will not. And that if we go ahead and not stop there, then you know, we're not going to be around, so it doesn't really matter what those numbers uh, really mean. And this is actually real. It's not just uh, some crazy guy from Berkeley Saying that, uh, page 27, Bloomberg uh, LP, which is uh, the uh, um, primary um, providers of financial information to the financial industry, has launched the first tool to measure unburnable carbon assets, also called stranded carbon. Um, page 28, a number of uh, foundations now have finally seen the, the light and said uh, we need to divest from fossil fuels and invest in renewable. There was an article recently on the New York Times. And finally, this is, uh, again, a big breath, please. Uh, and um, it's also, I know, understand, hard information to take in, but I think we do need to wake up. Uh, natural capital risk was a study done by the uh, UN. Uh, the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity uh, finished a 15-year study in April 2013 trying to measure basically unpriced natural capital. We are using, with our economic activity, uh, something that is provided by nature for free to us water and land or kind of natural resources we use and then you know we produce waste that need to be processed by uh, by our environment so it's land and air pollution greenhouse gases and waste and so what they did is they quantified in dollar terms the natural capital we use this is applying basically environmental economics which is to price some of the externalities and trying to apply classical economics to the whole process. And what they found out, we have a little chart on page 30 uh, just to you know, visualize that. But what they found, page 31, is that the largest region sector, and a region sector is economic activity in a particular sector occurring in a particular region. So for example, coal power generation in Eastern Asia is a region sector. And so what they did is they said, okay, what are the revenues of that sector and how much nat unpriced natural capital are they using? And so if you look at, for example, cattle ranching and farming in South America, the natural capital cost, mostly deforestation, uh, soil erosion, uh, water pollution, and so on, is staggering, $312 billion, but no one has to pay for that, and the sector generates about $17 billion in revenues, not profit, revenues. In other words, our uh, you know, hamburger at uh, McDonald's really, if fully priced, would cost uh, 30 or $40. Uh, and you know, page 32 is, is the top 20 high impact sectors. At the end of the day, if you look at page 33, the top 20 impact region sector used $3.2 trillion of natural capital to generate $2.4 trillion of revenues and none of them would be profitable if they accounted for the use of natural capital. And you know, overall, if you look at the, the whole economic activity worldwide, we used $7.3 trillion worth of natural capital in 2009 when the study was conducted. And, and this is hard to take. This is hard to take because what we're doing effectively is we're treating nature as a business in liquidation, and we're liquidating its uh, capital, uh, its natural capital. And this, in part, is what uh, keeps the economy going and those financial returns positive. So we have this little chart, a uh, little cartoon on page 34, um, you know, at the end of, you know, in a, in a not too distant future. Yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. So that's, to a certain extent, that what we're doing now, not only with uh, um, you know, fossil fuel investments, but also investments in very large multinational corporations. 
So uh, last thing, and then we'll go to the positive side of things. So uh, page 35, um, you might have been told uh, by your financial advisor that the secret to a safe in, uh, retirement is to have a well-diversified portfolio invested in stocks, bonds, real estate, and so on, and diversified geographically, and you buy and hold mostly and revise the portfolio every few months, and you're going to be just fine. Well, that's no longer the game that is played now. The game that is played is played with stuff that is on picture uh, on slide 35, and that is basically the uh, server banks of the New York Stock Exchange. A lot of investment um, uh, banks that are doing uh, proprietary trading are hosting their own server in the same room and paying a fortune for it because if you have your server across the street, light takes a fraction of a millisecond to go back and forth, and therefore the guys that have the server in the same room can beat you at high frequency trading. And in fact, on page 36, this was an article published in the Bloomberg Business Week. There is a group of investors that is um, funding at the tune of $200 million a second set of uh, 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 fiber op optic cables between the New York Stock Exchange and the London Exchange to shave about 5.2 milliseconds in the round trip and uh, get an edge in high frequency trading, which is really now what's happening. So to just recap, uh, page 37, you know, the financial returns are actually pushing us against the ecological limits because a lot of them are derived by converting unpaid natural capital into financial return. Liquidity and trading frequency are causing instability in our uh, system. I don't know if you remember the flash crash of 1,000 points some time ago. And more than 60% of the trades on the New York Stock Exchange is now high-frequency trading, which is done by computers at the tune of at least 4,000 trades per second. Uh, and we still have that issue of the $1,200 uh, trillion in derivatives sitting on the various books of the banks and the other investors, and that's a big question mark. So to summarize, page 38 is a really cute little creature. And this guy is a tardigrade. So the tardigrade is this, uh, it's about a one millimeter long, it's as thick as your thumbnail, uh, if you want. And um, it's really an amazing, resilient creature. It can live completely dried up with no water for 10 years. And then you add some water and this guy starts moving again. It also can handle radiation. Uh, there are 2,500 times the level that would kill a human and can just be comfortable in temperatures between minus 50 degrees and about 300. So I'm saying this because if you are a tardigrade, then your investment portfolio is probably perfectly positioned to create conditions in which you're, you'll have a very comfortable retirement. But if you're not, then I think it's time to realize that the investments we have today are creating the world of tomorrow, and we need to align them with the world we want to create. So um, I have to make a confession. So I left the industry in 2009 uh, when I realized how the financial system worked and I didn't want to be part of it. And then three years later, I was sitting on this cushion, not exactly this, uh, not that fancy, but I was doing a so-called meta practice, which is loving kindness practice. And you imagine sending loving kindness to your friends and family and then to a larger and larger circle, including at the end, all living beings around the world. And at that point, that was three years later, it struck me that I was already impacting living beings around the world through, our, through my own investments and that I had to overcome the fear of not being diversified enough or not getting a financial return for my portfolio and I had to divest from everything. So all stocks, all mutual funds, everything. And uh, uh, now what I'm doing is I'm gradually redeploying that capital, and I don't have much, unfortunately, but whatever I have, I do uh, invest in mostly local businesses, uh, mostly through slow money, with the aim, my personal compass uh, for making investments is on page 40. So I start from biophilia, which is the uh, innate law for everything that is alive, and I'm saying, okay, how can I support the conditions that are conducive to life with my investments? And that's the first criteria. And then I try to establish the relationship with the entity that uh, I'm planning to invest with. 
uh, slow money makes that easy because it brings together investors and entrepreneurs that are doing good things. And then only after the relationship is established, I would have um, an investment or make an investment or a transaction. So page 41, I found this really cute picture on the web. But this basically relates to uh, the biophilia, right? Our innate desire to protect and support life. And I think we need to invest as if life mattered. So um, maybe, let's see, I'm going to just jump into the way forward and the alternatives, because I think we've heard enough bad news. Uh, but I, I felt it was important for us to, to just open our eyes to what's happening out there and what our investments are really doing. So the way forward is really relocalize and democratize investments. In other words, uh, roll up our sleeves and start moving money from the old economy uh, to the new economy. And there are three great books that I would recommend on page 42, Inquiries into the Nature of Slum Money, Investing as a Food, Farm, and Fertility Mattered by Woody Tash, which really sparked the movement around the country, uh, Local Dollar, Local Sense by Michael Schumann, um, how to shift your money from Wall Street to Main Street and achieve real prosperity, and Locavesting by Amy Cortese, uh, the revolution in local investing and how you can profit from it. You can you know, start a group, uh, start reading it, and then maybe connect to one of the uh, slow money groups or local investing groups around the country. Uh, and I just want to mention a little bit about slow money because it's really the one, uh, when I left the finan financial industry, I thought I would never be involved with finance again. And then when I stumbled upon the work of Woody Tash, I was really inspired. And slow money has a set of principles, and the first one is we must bring money down to earth. Um, so that's, that's the first principle, that we're investing in real places, in people and enterprises closest, close to home, starting with food. And invest patiently with the goal of building healthy enterprises, communities, and ecosystems over the long term, and measuring the success by the world we create around us, not just you know, the financial return. And what is the health of the soil and not just the profit we make? So uh, Slamani is really about fixing our economy from the ground up. I actually participated in this. We uh, made an investment in Cape Valley Farm. Uh, shop is basically a um, program to aggregate about 40, the produce of 41 farms in Cape Valley and distributed it uh, through a CSA program. Uh, farmers markets are actually quite time consuming and not that profitable actually for farmers. And so the idea of having a group of people that can aggregate all their produce and do the marketing and the uh, farmer's market for them was really very beneficial to the farmers. And finally, there's another interesting model. It's uh, page 46, Slow Money Maine, No Small Potatoes Investment Club. Uh, a bunch of people came, in, came together, pitched $5,000 into a pool, and they all uh, collectively decide how those dollars will be loaned out to the local food producers. And so that has been a very uh, great learning experience and um, uh, established great relationships. And some of the people that are part of this uh, investment club eventually went off and did larger investments together in some of the same uh, entrepreneurs. So um, maybe, let's see, shall we see if there is any burning question out there at this point before I launch into the four new trends and the options are available to uh, participate in uh, local investing? Yes, let's see if there's any clarifying questions, any burning questions. I know that this is a lot of very dense information, really great information, and there will be a recording available in about a week. So um, people, anyone on the call can listen to it again because I think it takes a few passes. But in the meantime, press 1 on your keypad if you have a, a clarification that's really going to help you um, get, through the, get the rest of the information. Um, so we have Christine Gardner. Go ahead. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Wonderful. Hi. I'm so enjoying this conversation. And my burning question is, uh, we're uh, located in Southwest Oregon, really rural Southwest Oregon, and uh, really trying to build up the local economy here. And we're just stymied to wonder, how is any capital going to reach this very poor community to um, nourish initiatives? There's actually a lot of initiatives, but we just feel like the, the capital it isn't. It isn't. It, this our community is run by volunteers, and 
so few have any capital to part with. How do we get that capital at to, down to a very small local level at this time? Thank great. you. Great. Thank you for that. Go ahead, Marco. Great. That's a great question. Uh, I will uh, deal with that in the course of the presentation, uh, but thank you. This is a very important uh, question, right, because a lot of the capital is in the urban areas. So I will address that in the course of the, um, the rest of the presentation. And uh, I want to actually use the little buttons to ask you two questions. So uh, I'm curious uh, to find out um, about 120 people that are online right now, and these are all anonymous, so you, know, you can be candid in your answer. Um, I'm going to ask you a question, and you can press one, two, or three. So I'll give you three options on your phone, and then we can see the percentage. So the first question is, uh, if you have investments, either mutual funds or 401k plan that you uh, control, press 1. Uh, this could be also SEP IRAs and Roth IRA and so on. If you have pension investments that your pension benefit provider, for example, the employer controls but you don't control, if you're a teacher, for example, um, um, then somebody else controls your pension plan, uh, press 2. And if you have no investments at this point, press 3. So let's take a look at that. So again, would you just quickly go over what the options were, Marco? Yeah, the option are if you have investments that you control, and that could be either mutual funds or uh, retirement plans in a 401k or IRA that you can actually direct in one way or the other. Uh, if you have pension investments um, but no investments that you control that somebody else is controlling, press 2, and you have no investment at this point, you press 3. Okay, good. So more than, uh, than half of you, in fact, close to 60%, actually, yeah, um, sorry, um, it's about 47%, 50% of you have investments and you can actually control them. Uh, so that's great. This is the second question I'm going to ask you. If you have made some local investments besides your own business, if you're a business owner, I know if you're a business owner, you're going to put everything into your business, but if you've invested in somebody else locally, press 1. If you have not made any local investment yet but would like to do so, press 2. And if you're an entrepreneur looking for local investors, press 3. And then again, just review that, Marco, and we'll... Right, so one is you have made local investments, uh, you press 1. You have not made local investments but would like to, press 2. You're an entrepreneur looking for local investors. Okay, good. So what we got is uh, less than a quarter of you have made local investing. Remember, you had about uh, half of you that um, had assets that you could control. And about 42% have not made a local investment yet but would like to. And 15% of you are entrepreneurs in need of capital. So that, that's very helpful. Um, let me go back to the presentation, uh, and then we'll open up for uh, questions. And uh, thank you for all of those who um, ask questions at this point. And this actually, as I said, uh, Amy um, Pearl up in uh, Oregon is doing some very interesting work supporting uh, local communities uh, with uh, creating the conditions to make local investing successful. And I'm uh, collaborating with uh, Amy on, on this. And he has come up, she has come up with this idea that uh, there are four trends now that are going to revolutionize teacher investing. And the first one is social, the social enterprise movement. In other words, a lot of the millennials and young people do not want to work for a large, extractive, uh, profit-maximizing corporation. It just, you know, sucks your soul dry. And so they say, no, we want to do good, either for the economy or for the environment, and we want to use the for-profit model to keep going. And the goal is not to maximize the profit, but to reach profitability to continue to do good work in the community and uh, or in the environment. So those are the, the social enterprise movement. It's very exciting. Uh, the other one is impact investing, although I would argue all investments are impact investments. We might not be aware of what other impacts our investments have besides the financial return, but uh, there are some investors now, there are starting to awake to the idea that uh, they want to do something good with their investment, not just get financial returns. So ideally, I would want to see all investments being impact investing in the sense that we really need to pay attention to the non-financial impact of 
our investment activity. Uh, the JOBS Act and crowdfunding would really open up the possibility for local investing, which right now it's really hard because of securities laws. Uh, and those are being relaxed a little bit now. There are some crowdfunding platforms that are uh, taking advantage of that. And the local first movement is very powerful. We do that with uh, buy local, uh, eat local, and I think we also need to get to invest local. And so at the end of the day, at the intersection of that, we have a new way of deploying capital that builds sustainable, health, healthy communities. So I want to uh, basically say, okay, that sounds pretty cool, but what would the person in your, what can the person in your seat do? And I hope you're sitting down, because this has been uh, 50 minutes or, uh, already into the talk. So um, the first thing, and people don't quite recognize, is that moving your money from the very large banks to a regional uh, or a bank or credit union is the best thing and easiest thing you can do to increase the flow of local investing in your community. This is because the large banks uh, are no longer lending in uh, communities. They don't do small deals. They don't you know, invest in, in local uh, businesses. In fact, the small banks, regional banks, and credit unions, even though they only hold about 20% of the assets uh, in the United States, they make more than 50% of the local loans. So simply by transferring money from the too big to fail banks to a regional or credit union, you can start improving the conditions in your community. The other way is there are ways to invest that are not the standard investments, but they're still a way of providing capital to entrepreneurs to help them succeed. And joining a local community-supported agriculture is a great way to do that. If you are an eater, you can be an investor. Um, the um, the person, uh, I think it's Christine or Christina, sorry if I didn't uh, catch your name, uh, said uh, we don't have capital here in the rural communities, and that's true, but you still need to eat. And so there is some money set aside for paying for food. And so the idea of joining a CSA is a form of investment. You're giving the money at the beginning of the season to the farmer, and then you get paid in uh, basically the produce of that farm. So that's another way. Um, you can prepay for your favorite food, uh, food purveyor through a new uh, platform that's been developed within the Slow Money Network called Credibles, and I talked a little bit about that. Um, and uh, you can join your local Slow Money group. So there is actually a Slow Money group down in uh, um, Asheville, I believe, down in southern Oregon, and another one could be started to kind of figure out what to do. Uh, if you're trying to decide what to do with your money uh, as you move it out of Wall Street and all the crazy uh, global casino it uh, is in right now, you can park some money with RSF Social Investment Fund. This is a fund that uh, lends to um, uh, agricultural enterprises, uh, educational institutions, and institutions involved in art. And you can actually see exactly uh, who is receiving the money that you have invested in their fund. Um, and uh, the other thing, you can explore currently available platforms. So uh, page 53, this is uh, the Credibles. So you can go on Credibles.org. If you have a business you like that is a food business, uh, they can you know, list on Credibles, and you can prepay for your uh, consumption at that place. And so then you'll be eating your, credi your credits. That's why it's called Credibles, edible credits. And that's a way to uh, fund. There are a couple of um, local places here in California that raised twenty to thirty thousand dollars in in prepayments. We're able to um, um, get something done. Uh, there is also a um, uh, platform now called Cutting Edge X. Cutting Edge is a consulting company uh, led by Jenny Casson that has done very good work in terms of uh, tapping into alternative uh, sources of capital. Uh, in the community, and you can find uh, on page 55, there is basically Farm Fresh to You. You can't see it from the slide because it's an animated thing, but uh, there's something in California, a couple of uh, enterprises in California that have went through the process of registering with the local uh, state um, uh, regulatory commission uh, and can offer investments to the public. And then there is this Kiva Zip that is very interesting where people can come together and become, a community can become a trustee 
on Kivazit. In other words, they can vouch for the character and of the entrepreneur looking for uh, money, and they can sponsor basically that person on this platform and raise zero interest loans for a year, and $5,000 is the limit at this point, but after a couple of successful uh, repayment processes, uh, that trustee can uh, um, make loans for a larger amount, and this is open up to the whole community. So the community can actually invest as little as five, uh, you know, $5 into a loan and help local entrepreneurs. And there's also on page 57, and then I'll open up for question, there's also a platform to invest in your own city if you're in an urban environment. A lot of the commercial developers uh, invest in projects that have a pretty decent return. And so this platform allows uh, people living in that urban environment to actually participate in some of the commercial projects, real estate projects in their community. So. Um, now I'm basically done. I uh, added some material at the end that I might touch upon in the Q&A session, but I want to answer the question uh, that was, um, again, uh, presented initially, which is a lot of rural communities are really suffering. They do not have capital in their midst, although there is some, uh, but there is not that much. And so how do you deal with that? And this is a really tough um, problem to deal with, and part of it is, you know, the capital is concentrated in the cities. So some rural communities that are providing food, obviously, to uh, an urban center could try to engage in a, with a slow money group and help the people in the urban environments to invest in food and farming enterprises in their midst. And the other one is really trying to retain as much of the capital that is there, even if it is little, by again, moving the money from the large, too big to fail banks to a credit union or a regional bank operating in that setting, uh, by uh, maybe you know, funding some entrepreneurs through a Kiva Zip where everybody in the community can pitch in you know, $10, $20, and the entrepreneur can get a few thousand to get started by basically viewing all the money that exists there uh, and trying to retain it as much as possible and increase the, the multiplier. There are also, of course, other strategies for uh, compensating for the lack of dollars and money, for example, you know, but that can only really work for um, facilitating economic transactions and you know, time banks, alternative currencies, and so on, but for investments, really. Uh, it's it's tough, and I'm, and I'm don't know. I have a, a, an answer for you, but again, that's uh, the work that um, uh, Amy Pearl is doing in Oregon is helping rural communities, you know, retain as much as possible of their capital and invest it locally. So, shall we open up for more questions? Uh, let's do that. So, um, press one on your keypad if you have a, a question. And for some of you, I know you might have only had an hour. Uh, this will be recorded. Check our website in about a week's time for the recording. Um, David, we'll start with you. David Camp. Hi. Um, I'm wondering what the ratio, the the relationship between impact ratio and impact investing is, or is there one? And, and perhaps just a little, just a little more edification on how the impact ratio is calculated. And you're on slide 32 and 31. 32. And 31, okay, thank you for, for pointing me in the right direction. 32 and 31. Oh yeah, so that is, um, what I would suggest is, so basically the, um, the natural capital, right, for example, the case of uh, uh, cattle ranching is uh, 300 billion, right? And then uh, right. 16, 17 is the uh, revenues you get. So basically, if you divide the impact by 16.6, .6, you get uh, basically, the number is too big here for me to see it. Uh, let me go back to it. Um, so you get 18.7. Uh, In other words, you need $18.7 of natural capital to generate a dollar of revenues. 
that's how the impact ratio is basically yeah, no, the I, first time I, well, I, some of these numbers don't work though so if you have to look at natural gas power generation on the bottom it it, it gives a 1.0 and there's I, I couldn't figure out how that number relates to the two other numbers that are there right so i would refer you to the actual study uh, okay. and uh, let, let's see um but basically, oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. The impact ratio uh, for the, the page 32 is because uh, it only looks at one of the externalities. So in other words, here you're only looking at um, uh, cost is measure. Yeah, so you need to look at the, the study. And it is on my website. So if you okay. go on ek4t.com, essential knowledge for transition, Dot com and you go into the blog there is a blog that uh, is titled investing and the disappearance of the sacred that has a link to the uh, full study and if you're interested I would recommend you read it is it, really well done thank you and one just and is there any relationship between this impact ratio and impact investing or are they just two different no uses no, of no, the word no impact no, there is not. okay yeah. thank you um, let's go to Vanessa Warheit go ahead Hi, Marco, can you hear me? Yes, Vanessa, yes. Good to hear you. Hi. So my question is about tax sheltering um, because I, I, my guess is a lot of other people are in a similar situation, which is that most of our investments are in some sort of tax sheltered investment, which, um, and I know that you were um, in contact with some people who were looking at IRA um, uh, self-directed IRA advising, right. um, and I'm wondering right. if you have any more advice on that, on how, like for those of us, like I really want to do impact investing, but I don't want to lose the tax benefit. Absolutely, um, yes, recommend. yes. Very good question. So a lot of our investments are um, in 401k plans or, you know, mutual retirement accounts that are tax advantaged, right? So they either grow tax-free until you start withdrawing or uh, it's uh, after-tax uh, money that uh, can accumulate tax-free, like the Roth IRAs. So um, there is uh, a uh, process for basically hiring a custodian that holds your assets, and they can be held uh, with the same tax uh, um, advantages, but you basically tell them where to invest. In other words, you can do an investment in a farm uh, next door if you want, and basically, once you transfer your assets to a self-directed IRA custodian, you can say, here is the title to the note or to whatever it is, and hold it in my tax-exempt uh, um, account. And so we've done some work in terms of Solomon in Northern California. We have some resources. We've done some research on some of the um, more established uh, self-directed IRA custodians, and I'll be glad to share that information. Just um, send me an email. Okay, thank you. Um, next is David Wimberly. My my question is about how do you uh, switch over to investing in a gift economy? As you can probably guess, I've been reading a, a lot of Charles Eisenstein. And uh, further, how do these investments provide the resilience in case of severe economic uh, downsizing or, or even collapse uh, in various forms? Right. Uh, those are uh, two great questions. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, if we as a humanity manage to make the great turning, we might actually be operating more in a gift exchange economy where we're doing things for each other without uh, needing to be paid for it or exchange money. And I would uh, argue that the amount of volunteering that is going on right now is part of that gift exchange economy. I spend about 20 hours a week volunteering for slow money, and you know nobody pays me for that. And there are a tremendous amount of volunteer energy uh, around the country. Uh, there isn't really an investment besides the investment of time. In other words, the way you invest in the uh, gift exchange economy is with your time. And uh, as you do things for others, you create the goodwill that uh, is necessary to get something back when you are in need. So that's the way to invest in the in the gift exchange economy. For your second question, um, as I will explain more next month about the money and banking system, we could see a collapse in the money and banking system that could be really very 
uh, damaging to the economy, similarly to uh, what happened in 2007. Uh, and at the end of the day, the investments that are made locally to your local business, your local farmer, uh, are not subject to uh, price volatility, to high frequency trading, to collapse in the uh, stock market, whatever it is. It's just you're investing real people and real places. You still have, you know, if the business is still around and people buy food from them uh, or their products, then eventually they'll repay your investment. And so I would say uh, building for resilience is, you know, local investing is key for resilience in, in investing and to build resilience in the community. Uh, thank you, Marco. We're going on to Eric, Erica Charlesworth. Go ahead. Oh, yes. Thank you so much. I'm so enjoying this call and information from everyone. Thank you. Um, so I have two questions. Uh, and I, one is... Um, do you see eventually that will that our investments would really go to either a zero return or a negative return? You know, in order to really through this process, this great turning that you're talking about, when we really see that happening, that that's really what would we would begin to see is less and less return on investment, even going to zero or negative return. That is an excellent question, and uh, um, I'm writing an article on the fact that the financial assets have grown way more rapidly than our GDP. And you know, just think about what uh, what I said, right? The stock market and bond markets around the world as war uh, were worth last year 212 uh, trillion dollars. All that capital expects a financial return. And you know, some people expect I don't know eight percent for the stock market and five or six for uh, the bond market. Let's imagine it's just five. What we're talking about is ten trillion dollars uh, of financial return has to come at the end of the day from the global economy, which is seventy trillion. In other words, more than ten percent of the GDP worldwide would have to be devoted to pay the interest of the return of this financial asset. And if you look about real estate and, you know, venture capital and, uh, and all the other things. So I think eventually we'll wake up to the fact that we're not going to have returns, that a lot, <laughs> you know, a lot of the uh, returns are probably going to be negative. I mean, in the case of the oil companies, for example, the return we're talking about is probably minus 80%. If we oh. wake up and actually lo locked uh, you know, 80% uh, of their assets and say you can't sell this or you can not extract them or burn them, we're going to be losing at least 80% of the market capitalization. And that's the point I was making, you know. And so I would say if people say it's risky to invest locally, the returns are very low, I would say it's much better than a very large negative return, which is what we might eventually see in the highly intermediated financial markets around the world. Oh, thank you. Um, Scott Ragsdale, go ahead. Uh, Scott? I can, I, I, everyone can hear me, right? Yes, now we can. Okay. okay. Uh, wonderful uh, discussion, Marco. Very much appreciate uh, you taking the time uh, to edify everyone who's listening. Um, here in Davis, California, I'm looking forward to participating in a number of um, micro investments and things like that in the near future. And I'm just wondering, uh, from uh, a, a little bit broader perspective, uh, considering our political dialogue is uh, pretty much ensconced in, the, in our current notions of productivity and, and the measures of employment, how do you frame this positively to allow people to make that transition? Uh, to uh, a more sensible investment uh, strategy? Well, part is uh, employment, right? I mean, you're saying if you invest locally, you're supporting and creating local, local jobs. So the question mm -hmm. is, do you want to invest to create jobs in China, or do you want to invest to create job and opportunities in a higher multiplier mm -hmm. right, effect in your community? Mm -hmm. So uh, I would say, you know, the argument for local investing is so strong. I mean, it just uh, requires a little bit more effort, right, because it's not, oh, a nice diversified mutual fund where you can, you know, toss in some money and somebody else will deal with uh, investing and then just give you a financial return. 
uh, what I'm saying is that we have to wake up to the fact that that financial return might not be there. And uh, it, it does require a little bit more work because when you do local investing, you need to understand the business, you need to maybe support the entrepreneur, get to know the entrepreneur, and so on. But I would say at the end of the day, I feel is less risky overall, especially on a macro level, because the, the, uh, the current uh, investment system is very extractive and very damaging to, uh, to our chances of you know, long-term survival. So, and, and um, the, yep. Right, and a quick follow-up to that is traditional investment institutions clearly are not quite aware of this yet and, and will probably take a, a different opinion. What, what, is, what do you anticipate in, in terms of what that kind of um, uh, campaign might look like? Well, you know, I, the reason why I wanted to start with this uh, topic is because you can do something about it. You know, you can move your money to a smaller bank. You can decide to divest from a mutual fund and start investing locally. I mean, this is, you know, if we're saying, you know, the system needs to change and politicians need to do this or the large CEOs have to wake up and, you know, be uh, uh, behaving a different way. I mean, it's, it's really uh, hard to imagine that happening. But... When we're talking about local investing and buying locally and uh, prepaying from local food providers or other entrepreneurs, that's something we can do. It takes some work, but you know it's possible. So uh, the large institutions, I'm, uh, I see now some foundation finally to wake up, for example, waking up and say, why do we have you know, our assets invested in a way that could be contrary to our mission and then use 5% of those assets to try to achieve mission? Right? I mean, why do we do that? And uh, most of the people don't even measure the impact of their regular investments. But, for example, the, the list of foundations that decided to divest from uh, fossil fuel are finally realizing, you know, we really need to reconnect our mission with the way we invest our funds. I think, Marco, we have time for one more question, um, unless you want to stay on a little longer. Um, but we'll take Janet McFarland. Go ahead. Oh, um, hi. I'm really enjoying the um, presentation. You're really clear. Um, I don't have any money to invest. Um, I have some money in a pension fund, which I have no control over as far as I know. And um, yet I have control over how I spend my money. And one of the things that I'm sort of stuck with, it seems like, is Comcast. And how do I get Wi-Fi? That are we going to have a local Wi-Fi server here? I know they're doing that in some of the outlying areas. Or do you have any other uh, thoughts about that? Sure. Yes. Uh, so first of all, I just want to say that even though you don't control your pension uh, uh, plan, you can actually uh, let your voice be heard. So just to give an uh, an example, remember uh, the Sandy Hill. Uh, massacre, um, uh, I think it was December of, of uh, 2012, right? Um, what happened is that uh, the manufacturer of the semi-automatic weapon that was used was part of the Freedom Group that was owned by Cerberus Corporation. There was a, a, a private equity uh, firm that had about $700 million from the Calsters the pension fund for the teachers in California. So the, the California teachers had their uh, funds invested in, in about 700 million of them in the Cerberus Corporation that was holding the Bushmasters, uh, part of the Freedom Group, and, and the Bushmaster uh, produced the, the semi-automatic weapon that killed all those school kids. And so basically the, the teacher said, you know what, we are very uncomfortable about our investments being, you know, our pension being invested in a company that has, um, produces weapons that are illegal in California, for example, they're illegal uh, in the rest of the country. And so the, the manager of the plan uh, called the Cerberus Corporation and said, you know what, we're thinking about divesting from you guys and yanking $700 million out of you because we cannot support the type of investments you make. And uh, within a day, the Cerberus Corporation liquidated all the freedom industries, including the Bushmasters, and were kicked out. So in other words, even though you don't control, you can have your voice be heard. Uh, in terms of, uh, sorry, your second question was? Um, um, Marco, I can't remember who the person was now. 
Oh yeah, yeah. The local, the local yeah, wireless, yeah. right. So the idea is that some activities need to be done by large corporations. That's true, uh, and so we want to put some pressure on them to maybe uh, convert into benefits corporation or, uh, you know, not focus uh, solely on on profits and maximization. But there are a number of towns now that, for example, are providing uh, uh, wireless um, uh, services to their community as a uh, social benefit. In other words, there are some uh, municipalities that are actually providing that to all the citizens for for free. Uh, Gar Alperovic has a couple of examples in his latest book, What Then Must We Do, about some of these uh, um, local activities um, that are supporting businesses in the local uh, community. Marco, we are at our time. We usually run these for 75 minutes. There's eight other people with their hands up. Um, would you like to spend a few more minutes? Yeah, or... I'm, I'm fine. Yeah, yeah, I can be around. I'd be glad okay, to stay so until we'll, 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 we'll roll for another five minutes and check in again. So let's go to Mark Summer. Go ahead. Hi, thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, I agree with others, it's very clear. It seems to me in part that uh, when we start to look at returns in, uh, in a more conscious way, we move away from the notion of maximizing. I think this is a society that's obsessed with maximizing, whatever it be, money, fame, power, and that that is at the root, it's one of the roots of what goes wrong. So when you think about optimizing, perhaps we should be thinking about balancing many, many values, not just money, but connection to community, uh, connection to the land, uh, connection to future generations. Is that another way of thinking about this uh, as an optimizing society, an optimizing culture? Well, you're basically hitting the nail right on the head. Um, we humans are not good at thinking in systems. And if you've done any system theory research and study, you know that every time you maximize for a particular variable, you're going to endanger the uh, well-functioning of a system. And so that's what we've been doing. We're like very simple creatures that we think of ourselves as isolated from the rest of the world and plants and animals and ecosystems on which we depend. We're thinking on maximizing something that is easily measurable like money, how much money you have, right? And in the process, we might work way too many hours and, uh, you know, have troubles with our family because we don't see them anymore, right? Every time you just uh, pick a particular variable and try to maximize that, you are uh, creating problems within a systemic uh, setting. And so you are perfectly right. We need to, when we invest uh, or when we have a, an economic activity, we cannot think about maximizing profits as the only variable because if you do that, then you're going to uh, you know, maximize also externalities and the costs that you do not bear and somebody else has to bear. And so how do we switch to that way of thinking which is systemic and looks at all the various dimensions as a way of optimizing. If you want, we need to optimize uh, for um, you know, many variables, not just one. And you're right. Uh, so that's why I'm taking a system approach when I, um, when I present my material. Wonderful. Thank you, Marco. Um, Leslie Krenna, go ahead. Hi, this is Leslie. I am actually also from Davis, California, so I'm curious to, if it's possible to get the name of the gentleman from Davis as well. Um, I have a few questions. One was just to um, talk a little bit more about what a DPO is, because um, it wasn't absolutely clear to me there. And also, if the slow money organization has um, branched out to any uh, endeavors that are not food focused. Right. Um, yeah, so the first one is the reason why it's very hard to do local investing is because we have securities laws both at the national level and at the state level. When Facebook, for example, went public and sold its stock to the public, it had to register with the SEC at the national level and uh, with each of the 50 states 
securities offices to offer the security in each state. That is something that can cost, uh, you know, upward to, you know, a million dollar in legal fees or more. So there are some exemptions from the registration at the national level, and one of them is the intrastate exemption. The SEC says if, you're pl if your business is in one state, you're planning to sell primarily in that state and uh, to only solicit investors in that state, then you don't need to register with us. Uh, we can give you an intrastate exemption, which means you just register with the state authorities. A DPO, a direct public offering, uh, is a, an offering that has been registered with the state and it's counting on a particular exemption from uh, the full uh, national registration with the SEC. So a DPO is a, is a way of registering your security at the state level or at any state in which you're planning to offer your security and it's usually much less costly to go through. Uh, but after you do that, you can actually do public and general solicitation. You can actually do advertising. You can talk about your investment, which you couldn't really do uh, unless you, uh, you go through the process of registering your security. And this is a little bit technical, unfortunately. We don't have time to get into it. But uh, if there is interest, maybe we'll do a, a different webinar on, on you know, the, the legal aspects and, and uh, the platforms and the evolution in the uh, crowdfunding and uh, uh, local investing space. Good. And then the slow money question too. Slow money, uh, you know, slow money starts with food. And there is, uh, first of all, it's all volunteer driven. And we figured, uh, you know, we understand food. Everybody relates to food. And it's easier for us if we make local investing to understand whether uh, a food entrepreneur uh, or business is viable. Uh, so slow money per se, uh, is not about doing, you know, uh, renewable energy investments and so on. But having said that, once people come together and form a slow money group or an investment club or an investment group, then they can decide to, you know, start looking at other um, type of investments if they have the expertise. Uh, what I found personally is that, um, uh, you know, it's easier for me to understand uh, a farm or a food business and know whether it makes sense to invest in it than even a solar installation company. I don't know what the issues are, you know, what the um, problems are with the production of panels in China and the cost of that fluctuating that has taken out a lot of local solar uh, businesses. So, but yeah, so slow money is really focused on food and farming. Uh, thank you. And I think this will be need to be our last question. There's still some of you with your hands up. I apologize for not being able to get to all of you. Um, Marco, please do, as soon as I, I, uh, we hear from, from Miles, who will be next, um, remind people of your website. You do blogs um, and any other information so that people can continue to learn. So Miles, go ahead. Hi, Marco. Uh, my name is Miles. Uh, I own a business in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area named Albany Arts Gallery. Um, we're really focused on promoting local uh, producers and manufacturers through a holistic permaculture lens. And I'm really interested in how I can help my community establish monetary sovereignty. Um, I have a specific question on your thoughts on how we can use the Bitcoin platform or other blockchain cryptocurrencies um, to help small communities build their local economy. Um, it seems like a particularly powerful tool to track exchanges within time banks, barter banks, other social capital, tool lending libraries, and micro community banks. Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, so the Bitcoin, you know, everybody is talking about Bitcoin now because it went from being worth a few cents uh, per Bitcoin about a couple of years ago. Uh, and uh, in June of last year, it was about $100 per Bitcoin, and it went up to, uh, I think, more than 1000 so a lot of people kind of love the idea of, my goodness, Bitcoin, so I put some money there and it's going to you know, multiply by 10 in six months. Um, to me, that is uh, not a very um, um, successful currency per se because of the very wild fluctuation and the fact that it can be manipulated very easily. As you probably know, it's created, um, you know, it's basically a crypto um, commodity that can only be 21 million at the end you know, of the day. You can't produce more than 21 million bitcoins right now. It's about, I think, more than 10 million 
or 12 million, something like that. And it can, uh, the transaction can be anonymous, which means that some people can use it to make transactions that are illegal in their um, uh, jurisdiction. And so there is a certain uh, attractiveness to that. You can also make legal, uh, of course, transactions. You can donate to, um, you know, no profits by software and things like that. Uh, I don't think that is a very good uh, uh, currency to base local activity on because of how easily manipulated its value is. I wouldn't be surprised if the big boys in Wall Street are using, you know, a billion dollar uh, of spare change to manipulate the price of Bitcoin up and down and, and milking it for all it's worth. Um, I would rely more on designing a local currency uh, in an appropriate way, and I would recommend a book by um, Tom Greco, The End of Money and the Future of Civilization, that has uh, uh, a good explanation of what are the design feature of a successful local currency. Thank you, Marco, for everything, for all of this information. Again, there will be a recording on our website in about a week. Um, you can look for it in the online training archives. We'll have it there, and we'll also have it in our newsletter. We encourage you to join our newsletter, keep abreast of all this good material and future teleseminars, etc. And um, Marco, I wanted to give you closing, your closing thoughts. And then what I'll do is I'll unmute everyone, and on your way out, you can give a shout out to Marco with your thanks, and maybe let him know uh, where your where your locale is. So closing thoughts, Marco. Um, yes, that basically, uh, if you are passionate about a particular issue, make sure that your investments are not working against you. <laughs> And it might take a little bit of looking into it, but I think it's important that we align our investments with the things we're trying to make happen on the ground and in society. And finally, uh, I would encourage you to uh, go to my website if you have uh, a curiosity to learn more, and I have a lot of resources up there. It's ek4t.com, so essential knowledge for transition number four.com, and you have the contact information in in the slides. If you have a question that uh, did not get answered, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I think you have the um, in your slide uh, a way to contact me. Um, so please do so, and I'll be glad to get back to you. Thank you for the opportunity. And thank you once again, Marco. So the next one is March 19th. That's sort of the second installment, Money and Banking System, and then April 23rd on the economic system, all, both with Marco coming up.